the foundation of the world, God's purpose was to send his son Jesus. That was his intention from the beginning, to send his son Jesus into the world that Jesus might demonstrate the love of God on the cross for each and every last one of us to receive a brand new life in him. That was from the beginning. I mean, before he even said, let there be light, before he established everything here on earth, he already had a plan for his son Jesus to come here on earth. That was his plan from the beginning. And the reason why is because sin entered into the world. We know that sin entered into the world when he told Adam and Eve, he says, from this tree, do not eat, right? He says, you can eat from every tree. Talking about in in Genesis chapter 2, you can eat from every tree from in this garden, but this one tree, I do not want you to eat. But in the day that you do, you will surely die. Now, when we're talking about death, we're talking about separation, okay? Death means separation. Now, in the physical, it means the soul and the spirit separates from the body. That's why when someone dies physically, their soul and their spirit separates from the body. You can't talk to that person anymore. And the soul and the spirit goes either to heaven or to hell. And so, you know, that's what it means in the physical. But if you read in the Bible, Adam and Eve still were physically alive, so he wasn't talking about that. He said, you'll surely die. So obviously he was talking about spiritual death. And let me tell you why we know he was talking about spiritual death. And death represents separation. So there is a physical death, the soul and the spirit separates from the body, but there's a spiritual death where we're separated from God. And that's why and that's why when God said, where are you? Because he was separated from him now. He said, where are you, Adam? And, and there was a separation. And what happened? Because of the lack of communion and connection and, you know, engagement with God, he was afraid now. And so now he's afraid. He said, well, I was afraid. And so because there was a separation, there was a death. That's what he meant by death. He says, well, you'll be dead. You'll die if you eat from this tree. And so the Bible also talks about in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, he says, the wage of sin is death. So what was sin? Separation. You know, it was a separation from from man and and God's word because God said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there was a separation. He says, well, I'm not connected to that. I don't believe that. So I'm going to go ahead and try it out. You know, Eve ate from the fruit, and then she gave it to her, her husband, who was with her. And so there was a separation after that. And he says, the wage of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life. I've always asked myself, how is it that a holy, pure, loving, truthful God can reconcile him allowing us to come into his presence when we're sinful? How is it that God can be fair towards sin and at the same time justify the sinner? Like, how is it that we can be sinners, but then he already said, let there, you know, let there be death if you disobey. The ways of sin is death. So how does he do it? Well, that's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is all about God closing the gap, God fulfilling his promise, God saying, I love you so much that I'm going to send someone to solve this problem that you guys have called spiritual death. There was, there was a separation. And it's still the same way when, when you and I are like, you know, not really into the things of God or really just don't want to go to church or just really don't want to hear what God has to say. That's because there's something going on in our life. All right. They, you know, and, and the Bible calls it sin. Some of us say we made a mistake. Right. Or some of us say, like, you know, you know, I'm just not feeling it or whatever we call it. But the Bible calls it sin. OK. And so it's sin separates us 
from God. We don't want to be around God. We want to hang out with God. I don't want to talk about God. I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to open up the Bible. I don't want to get on my knees and pray. I don't want to do any of that. Why? Because of sin. And that's what it means by death. You don't physically die and just, you know, disappear because you sin and you go into a casket and go into the grave. No, you don't do that because of sin. But there's a physical Death, and there's also a spiritual death. And obviously, God is talking about a spiritual death when he says the wages of sin is death. But what's so beautiful about that question, how is it possible for God to be fair towards sin and at the same time justify the sinner? Well, God found a way, and the solution is called substitution. That's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is all about incarnation, right? Incarnation is this. Incarnation is that God became flesh. Incarnation means flesh, meaning with flesh. Like, you know, now, you know, God is in the flesh, meaning he's in a body. That's what he's saying, incarnation. So so when Jesus is born, that's what that is. It's incarnation. Have you ever heard of the word reincarnation? Reincarnation means like, okay, if you die, you actually be incarnated again. Re, meaning again. So you come back in the body again. Some people think different things about that, and they have different faiths. But we truly know incarnation is God turned into a human being. God actually came out and hung out with us, the Bible says. That's so cool, right? God came to hang out in your neighborhood, right? He came to the hood. He came, he came to hang out with you. That's so beautiful, right? Just to know that God would care enough. He, he took the form of a human, 100% human, which meant he was hungry, right? And in the Bible, it talks about him saying that he actually was hungry, and he sent his disciples to go get some food. The Bible talks about him being thirsty, It was this lady at the well, and she said, hey, girl, let me have a drink of that water. So he's thirsty, right? That means he's human. He he also felt heartache. His buddy, Lazarus, died, and he actually felt that. That's humanity. That's humans that do that. He felt sad. One time, you know, he was on the mountain. He was looking down on Jerusalem. He, He says, man, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, gosh, I wish I could gather these together like a hen does his little chicks. Because you guys are just so scattered everywhere. He was sad to see the world in that condition. Also, he, he was in amazement. So these are most emotions. He was in wonder. So some people say, well, if he was God, how could he actually be surprised about something? Because he was 100% man as well. So he took on all of humanity. And it confuses some people. It's called hypostatic union. Hypostatic union means you can be God is 100% God and and he's 100% man. That's Jesus. And the biblical term is hypostatic union where there's a union and, and, you know, it's not mixed. So he can be 100% God. And he can be 100% man as well. Now, it's hard for us to process that, but he's God. He can do whatever he want to do. He was hungry. He was thirsty. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, I love this in the God's word translation. It says, since all of these sons and daughters, talking about you and I, have flesh and blood, talking about we're bodies, Jesus took on flesh and blood to be like them. He did this so so that by dying, he would destroy the one who had power over death, that is the devil. I want you to get this, and I want you to really jot this down or remember it. Jesus limited himself, but Jesus did not lessen himself. So important to understand that because the one who could could give himself for man, talking about God, God could give himself for man. He needed to become human to represent man. There was no way he could just come down here he, he, and not become a man. He had to become a man. He had to come as a form. And what we call that is incarnation. Okay. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 through 18 in the message translation says it another way. It says that's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as the high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, verse 17 said, all the pain, all the testing, and he would be able to help where help was needed. Isn't that so good? Isn't it so good that Jesus, he came and he experienced everything we experience? Incarnation, a human. He became a human being. God became a human being. He came to hang out with us. That's what this is all about. That's why we get to spend thousands of dollars this year. <laughs> I don't know where that came in, but you know, we do it, right? <laughs> That's one of the traditions we added to it. But it's really all about God becoming a human and then identifying with us, which we call identification. He can identify with you and I. That's so good. See, because there was a time when people will worship gods, and there are still people that worship different gods, and they can't identify with them. Identification is very important in the Christian life. Identification means that I can relate with you. I can understand you. I get it. And don't you need a God that gets it? There's been so many people that worship other gods that the God don't get it. The God is like, you know, the God don't understand you. The God, you know, you're talking to him. He don't, he's never been there. He's never cried. This God has never experienced pain. This God has never understood where you're coming from. I don't even understand how people worship idols because Jesus gets us. He actually gets where we're going through. Every pain we experience, this is why we should be able to pray to God and talk to God because he actually gets it. You know, you're not talking to someone that don't understand what you're going through. I love that about Jesus. I love that Jesus actually understands my heartache. I, I love that Jesus actually gets when I'm crying and when I'm hurt and when I'm confused. You know, well, we have to come to him in this way because he can actually help us this way. You know, we don't have to act like we got it all together. We don't have to be macho. We can come to the Lord and he says, you know what, I, I understand you. And that's what identification is all about. Identification says that Jesus experienced Everything that humans experience. Jesus can identify with you. And that's why we should open up and talk to him about whatever issues we have going on in our life. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says it like this. Jesus, our high priest. Jesus, our high priest is able to understand our weaknesses. Isn't that good? He's able to understand our weaknesses. If you're weak today, you don't have to try to play it off and act like you're strong. If you're in a space where, you know, this is a holiday where, where you know what, this may be your first holiday without a loved one that passed away last year. You know, you may be, uh, you know, missing a, a, a parent or a sibling that you lost some time back. Or, and you know what, you say, hey, I wish I could hang out with that loved one this Christmas season. Jesus actually can understand exactly what you're going through. And you can come before him and pray and ask him, Lord, I'm weak. Can you strengthen me? Lord, can you strengthen me? Because I am weak. And when Jesus lived on earth, here it is, he was tempted in every way. So if you're ever tempted to violate the will of God, if you're ever tempted, well, when you are tempted, let's put it like that. Because it's not if you are tempted. It's when you are tempted, you know, you can begin to start talking to the Lord because he was tempted in every way, but he never sinned. So, so important to realize that Jesus gets it, that Jesus understands you. Jesus knows what you're going through. It really disturbs me when I have conversations with people because my story is I used to be involved in gangs. I used to be involved in drugs. I was a convict, and Jesus saved me. And so I got a lot of buddies that used to be in gangs and drugs, and so, so I'll, I'm, I'm the type that I really want to make sure that I let them know. I'm, I still get it. I still get it, man. I, I understand your pain. I understand your struggle. <laughs> so I, I want to actually go and hang out. 
I want to hang out. I'm not going to be off distant. You're going to see me in the hood. You're just going to see me. You're just going to see me. I'm, I'm not someone that's going to be distant. I'm going to be right here. Because I'm trying to give you a picture. That's the same way Jesus, Jesus don't, you know, Jesus don't exile you because of your sin. Because remember, he solved this problem, this gap, this separation problem. And it's called substitution. And we're going to explain that. How he done it was he was incarnated. He became a human being. Two, he identified with you. But three, the next thing is there was a separation. Even though there was a separation between us and God, it was a big separation. Because of sin. Big separation. He came here as a human, but there was a separation between the way we conduct ourselves and the way he was going to conduct himself. There was a separation because he was 100% God as well. So there was a big difference. Not not only was he human, but remember, there was a separation because he's 100% God as well. And so back in the day, they used to have Old Testament priests. And the priest would actually go to God on behalf of mankind, and they would have to confess their sins, and they would have to confess everyone else's sins as well to God. They would go into the church. They would go into the temple. They would go into the tabernacle, what they called back then, and they would come like to this altar, and they would say, hey, God, me and my wife got into an argument. Man, you know what? I got upset. So forgive me for getting upset. And he would confess all his sins. Then he would start confessing everybody else's sin because he was a priest and people would confess to him. You know, you know, no disrespect to Catholics, but you know how some Catholics, they have their little, they they have the window and you go in and you start confessing to the priest. And then the priest, you know, supposedly was supposed to go and actually go present that to God, which beautiful thing is, is Bible says in First Peter chapter two, verse nine, he said, you are a holy priest, meaning once you accept Jesus, you can go to God yourself. You don't have to confess to other people. You can if you want to. But the reality is you have access to talking to God yourself. Isn't that so beautiful? Right. And so so in the Old Testament, they would actually go to the priest and they would confess all their sins. And then they would confess everyone else's sins to God as well. And when they confessed them, you know, they would come back and then they would tell the people what God said. It sounds very exhausting, right? No, for real. It sounds exhausting. It sounds like a lot of work. Thank God that they cut that one out, right? But that's what would happen. I mean, but he was sinful. So he had to confess his own sin. But Jesus, he's separated from that. There's a separation between Jesus because Jesus never sinned. Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23, it says, earlier there was a lot of priests. They died and had to be replaced. But Jesus' priesthood is permanent. Isn't that good? It's forever. It is forever. I'm happy about that, right? He says, look, he says, He's there from now to eternity. I love that. You can talk to Jesus anytime. From now to eternity. Like forever. That's everlasting. I don't even know how long that is, but I know it's forever. You can talk to Jesus forever. Look what he says. He says, to say, look, he's to save everyone. I like that. Because there's no one exempt. Like, you can be horrible. I remember when I came to Christ, I, was, I felt real horrible. I felt guilty about all the things I'd done when I was in gangs and I was involved in drugs. I felt guilty. So I didn't know if God wanted to deal with me or not. You know what I mean? I was like, man, I'm a mess. I'm talking about, <laughs> nah, y'all don't understand. A mess, you know what I mean? And so, so when I come to God, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I heard people say that God forgives and he does all that, but I don't know if he's going to do that with me because, whoa, I got a long list of stuff. And he says, but he says, he saves everyone who comes to God through him. So you got to come to God through Jesus Christ. I don't know how people are coming up with this stuff that you can come to God outside of Jesus. Bible says right here that you have to come through Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father if he doesn't come through me. And so, Jesus, that's why we celebrate Christmas. 
We celebrate Christmas because it's all about him. And so in verse 26, look what it says in Hebrews 7, 26. I love this too. It says, so now we have a high priest. He says, in the old days, they had this old high priest where, you know what, he had the, all this work to do. And then he would die, and then somebody else would have to take his place. And be like, hold up. Jesus is here forever. He's permanent. You can come to him when you want to. Because look what he says. So now we have a high priest who perfectly fits our needs. Oh, my God. How many of us got some needs around here? You know what I'm saying? He perfectly fits your need. I got needs all day, every day. I'm a needy person. I thank God that God is not like just, you know, like he, his nerves are bad. Some of us think God's like that. Well, no, I came to him yesterday. Well, I'm coming to him all day. I'm sorry. I'm just like all day. I'm like, oh, God, I know I just got to talk to you a few seconds ago, but also because I got a whole bunch of issues. Anybody got any issues? I mean, I got some issues. Oh my God, I got some issues. He says, so now we have a high priest who, verse 27 says, now we have a, 26, so now him, uh, we have a high priest who perfectly fits our needs. When I say perfectly fits our needs, completely holy, that's the, where the separation is. See, he's God, he's man, but he's, there's a separation between him and mankind also. So not only is, was he incarnated, but he can identify with us, but it also he's separated. There's a separation because he's holy, totally holy, uncompromised by sin. None of us can say that, right? It says, without, it says, with authority extending as high as God's presence in heaven, unlike the other high priests, verse 27. He doesn't have to offer sacrifices for his own sins. That's so important. Verse 27 makes it clear. He says he don't have to sacrifice for his own sins because that's what makes the separation. This is what Christmas is all about. God became a baby, incarnation. God came as a human. He can identify us. God came as God because he was separated, right? So beautiful to separate himself from all the others, all the other high priests, all the other individuals. This is so beautiful. It says, unlike the other high priests, he didn't have to offer sacrifice for his own sins every day before he could get around us and our sins. What if he was a real sinful priest, right? He'd be in there talking all day and he even got to your prayer yet. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, man, I'm going to court, bro. Uh, can you go in there and go pray for me? Yeah, he go in there. And he got to pray for an hour about his. They already found me guilty. Hold up, man. My God, you supposed to, you got too many sins. He said, by the time he get around to yours, you know what I'm saying, he, he might be tired, right? You know, he says, unlike the other high priest, he didn't have to offer sacrifice for his own sins every day because he, uh, before he could get around to us and our sins, he's done it. I just love those three words, right? He's done it. He's done what? Whatever you're seeking. He's done it. God has done it. Can somebody say God's done it? No, 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 no. We need to do God has done it. No, for real. I mean, a lot of times we're waiting for him to do something, but he's already done it. Like, haven't you been saying, well, I'm waiting for God. No, God has already done it. Everything is already done. It is finished. So beautiful. He said he's done it. Look, once and for all, I mean, you don't have to keep on doing it. It's already done. Offered up himself. He offered up himself. He offered up himself. He didn't offer a sacrifice. He offered himself because he was separated. If Jesus was only man, his sacrifice for our sins would not be acceptable. They would be unacceptable because he's a man only. But he is a man, but he's 100% God. So the substitute we need, the substitute that we all need is a holy and sinless sacrifice. We needed God to go up 100% God on behalf of us. He had not committed any sins. John chapter 8 verse 46 says, can any of you convict me of committing of sin? I love that. Jesus come charging people up. Everybody always thinks just because Jesus died that he was some type of mark or something. Like he was something soft about Jesus. 
No, he's not. No, seriously, think about this. G, this is like me going up to, you know, going up to the court of law and say, look, can anybody charge me for any charges? Have I done anything out here? Have I violated any rules? Have I violated any law? Like he was going to the authoritative figures at that time. You had the Roman, you know, uh, you know, had the, you had the Roman government and then you had the Jews that was in the religious sect. And that's who ruled the world at that time. And so the Roman government let the Jews just rule their people. You guys rule them with your religious ways and your your religion. And so he came to check them. Jesus says, look, can any of y'all say that I did anything wrong? Now, that was pretty aggressive statement. It's very aggressive. He says, can any of you convict me of committing a sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Another statement is John the Baptist said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So there's another guy. He testified on his own. And then John the Baptist testified. And then guess what? In Matthew 3, 17, God testified about him. God said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. So he says, this guy's perfect. He doesn't do anything wrong. Yes, he's human, but he relied on me in order for him to do nothing wrong here on earth. Because Jesus was separate from sinners, he was an acceptable substitute. Because he is God in the flesh, he could identify with humans. But because he was separate from humans, he could be an acceptable substitute. So all of that tied in together, him being God in the flesh, that's incarnation, him being able able to identify with us, that's identification. Him being separate because he's 100% God, that makes him acceptable before God as a sacrifice. And that's what allows him to be our substitute. We started this message in this talk talking about the wages of sin is death. That's the wages of sin. The wages of sin. Anyone who commits sin is supposed to be put to death. Physically, obviously, we die, but spiritually, there's a separation between us and God. So something has to die. Well, back in the early days, they would sacrifice an animal. When Adam and Eve committed a sin, they sacrificed the animal, and that animal, he clothed them because he could see that he was naked. Oh, my God, I'm naked. You can always tell when you're deep in sin is because you're focused on yourself. See, they, they, they weren't focused on themselves. Remember when they were clothed with God's glory, they never focused on themselves. They never even paid attention to themselves. They were just walking around naked in the garden, to hanging out with God, and then as soon as they sinned, <gasps> they start focusing on themselves. And so God got an animal, innocent animal, and he killed it. And then he covered them up. But it was not about them being covered up. It was about something has to die. That was the substitute. So important for us to grab this. The substitution. Jesus became our substitute. Jesus did what? He became our substitute. Jesus took on all the sins onto himself. All the sins of the world came onto Jesus that day on that cross. He became our substitute. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says it like this. He, talking about Jesus, God who made him, Jesus, who knew no sin. He didn't commit a sin. That's the separation part. God made him, talking about Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin, meaning the offering for sin, and on our behalf, because he had never committed a sin. He didn't need to present a sin uh, offering on his own behalf. Remember, he's separate. He's perfect. He's holy. He's God. So he don't have to make a sacrifice for himself like the Old Testament uh, priest. He says, now he came and made a sacrifice on our behalf. Here it is. So that we, talking about us, the humans, all of the world, might become the righteousness of God in him. Might. The reason why he puts might is because so many people choose not to. Because it's a, it's a willing choice. Might, if, those words are, are free will choices. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just. 
He's faithful and just. We're not, we're not questioning his character. But if you confess your sins, he said, you know, he, he already paid for the sin debt, but you might become the righteousness of God if you choose him. So what he's done is concrete, it's complete, but what we are, we're in a place here on earth where we got to make a decision. We got to make a decision. Because Adam and Eve, they had the innocent animals to cover their, to become the substitute for their sins, because for their atonement. I remember there was Jesus and a guy named Barabbas. Jesus was innocent, of course. He'd done nothing wrong. Barabbas was this criminal. And so this high up authoritative figure has an opportunity to cut somebody loose because every year they cut someone loose. And they said, who should we let go? Who should we set free? Barabbas or Jesus? And they said, Barabbas. They said, well, what should we do with Jesus? They said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Well, this guilty criminal was set free because this innocent man took, on, took his place. He became the substitute. He was innocent. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. And that was the picture of substitution. The picture of substitution is someone innocent, Jesus, is going to take your place because the wages of sin is death. Something has to die. For years, they had animals, goats, they had lamb, but Jesus says, we're not going to keep on doing that. I'm going to be the final atonement, permanent, forever, everlasting. He says, it's done, it's over. Once I do this, it's done once and for all. It, but it's not the question. Today is not the question. Today we don't have the question if we're guilty or not. It, it's not a question of your guilt or innocence. Because everybody in here is guilty. Everybody in this neighborhood is guilty. Everybody in this city is guilty. Everybody in this state is guilty. Everybody in the United States is guilty. You know what? The whole world is guilty before God. Everyone's guilty. We need to make that clear. We need to get that understood. The question now is not, will, are you guilty or innocent? The question now is, will you accept God's substitute as your substitute? Will you allow Jesus to take your place? Will you allow Jesus to, you know, come into your life? And this is the question today that we're posing. Jesus did what? He became your substitute. Jesus became your son. Jesus' death is a payment for your sins. And as we close, I want you to know that there was this great evangelist. His name was Billy Graham. And he was speeding, coming from one of his events, one of his crusades. He was speeding through this little small country town. Sheriff pulls him over, gives him a ticket. Now, at this time, Billy Graham could have ran for the president and probably won. But he chose, he told him one time, he said, why you don't run for president? He said, I would never denounce myself to that. I have the highest calling there is on earth, and that's preaching the gospel. So the sheriff gives him a ticket. Billy Graham says, well, I don't want to leave this town and not pay this ticket because I may not come to this town again and I don't want to hang it over my head. He says, well, you know, you can actually follow me to the courthouse and the judge can take care of that. He says, okay. So it's a small town. They get to the courthouse. The sheriff walks him in. Then he disappears. The bailiff takes him up to the, where the judge would be standing and the sheriff comes in, he's buttoning up his robe, and now he's the judge. Such a small town, you know, he's the sheriff and the judge. He says, well, uh, your honor, sheriff, I don't know what the, 
He says, well, he, he gave him, Billy Graham gives him the ticket, the great evangelist, Billy Graham gives him the ticket. He says, that'll be $15. He says, I need your identification. Billy Graham reaches into his wallet, gives him his ID, and he says, I thought that was you. You're Billy Graham. He says, wow. He says, okay, okay, wow. He says, so Billy Graham started putting his wallet back in his pocket like, yeah, well, sure, I'm not going to have to pay this $15, right? Because he told him it was $15. So, so he put, he's about to put it in his pocket, and then the judge said, well, that's $15, Billy Graham. So he's like, oh, man. So he started pulling his wallet back out. He says, but you know what? The judge goes in his own pocket and pulls out $15. He says, but I'm going to pay it on your behalf. And that's a beautiful picture because Billy Graham was guilty. And sometimes I think we think that guilt means there's no payment. The judge had to pay because the, the law had been broken. And that's the same thing with you and I. You know, in sin, if we're in sin, the law has been broken. Someone has to pay. And the, the question is not, are you innocent or are you guilty? The whole world is guilty before God of sin. And Christmas is all about us accepting the sacrifice that Jesus made on behalf of our sin. Christmas is all about Jesus substituting us. We were supposed to be on that cross. But Jesus, accept, Jesus accepted the role of dying for you and I. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus died for you. And the question is simple. Will you accept his sacrifice? Will you accept his substitution? Will you allow him to take your place? Because some of us have been trying to carry the weight of our sins for a long time. And that's why guilt and shame is so deep in this society and generation now. Anxiety and worry and fear is at an all-time high around this season because parents are trying to get all their children all the things they want and then they, they're, you know, concerned about, oh, my God, my mom, you know, I'm not, I wish my mom could see me now and she's not here or, or my dad could see me now. And around this Christmas time, people begin to start carrying the weight of their sin more than any other time. In life. But even if you've accepted Jesus Christ to take the sin or the penalty of sin off of you, we need as Christians to learn how to allow him to take the power of sin up off of us. The weight of sin. Because maybe you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and, and you know you don't have to worry about going to hell. But you can live right here on earth like hell and still be a Christian. So the Lord wants to make sure that he takes that weight up off of us as well. He saves us from the penalty of sin, but Jesus also wants to save us from the power of sin. Jesus does a work for us, but he also wants to do a work in us. He wants to do something in our hearts so we won't have to walk around carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. Today I ask you to bow your head and, and let me pray a special prayer for you. Because God, he gives his gift to us, Jesus. And I want us to be able to appreciate that day in and day out. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name. That you would begin to build a heavy conviction in our hearts. A conviction that would cause us to pursue you in a deeper way. That we would cast our cares on you because we know that you care for us, you love us. Help us to cast our fears and our anxieties and our, and our hurts and our worries and our doubts this Christmas season. Help us to cast those cares on you, Jesus. You already paid for all of our sins. 
to set us free in the name of Jesus. I pray for freedom this Christmas season. Freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, freedom from doubt. In the name of Jesus, freedom that you would take that freedom into your household, into your marriage, into your job site, everywhere you go, that you would walk in that freedom, that you would walk light because the chains have been broken, because you are free as you walk in the authority God has given you and have entrusted you with, because he has become your substitute. He took your place. In the name of Jesus, I just want to—I just want to pr- speak favor over your household, speak favor over over your marriage, speak favor over your children, speak favor over your life, over your purpose, over your calling. That you would release it in the name of Jesus, with hands lifted all over the place. In the name of Jesus, a fresh anointing to be released over your life this Christmas season. That you won't be worried. You will focus on Jesus becoming a human, identifying with you. Thank God that he's separate from you and I because he's sinless. And that he became your substitute. Today we're lifted hands. We're grateful in here. We're grateful, Jesus. We're grateful, oh God. We're grateful that you love us so much that you came down here oh, in a wicked place to set us free from damnation, oh God. To give us freedom and healing, oh God. In the name of Jesus, shackles broken today. Whether you're online, whether you're in this house, shackles broken in the name of Jesus.